Hello, everybody. We are going to be looking at um, Unit 13 tonight. And Unit 13 talks about programming concepts. And um, we're going to kind of look um, at programming as kind of a, a general overview thing. And I'm noticing in my PowerPoint a typo, so here I, I can't help but fix it. Sorry. Um, but we are going to talk about programming as a concept. And you know, we are going to use one language to focus on in order to talk about programming concept. And that's going to be a, a language called JavaScript. Uh, as I was explaining just before the video started, the reason that JavaScript is a great first choice for somebody just wanting to experiment with programming a little bit is it does allow you to create very simple programs that you can run in a web browser. And so you don't need specialized tools or environments in order to execute the code. Every computer system already has these tools present um, just by virtue of having a web browser and a text editor. Um, what's most important to me here in this um, chapter, though, is that you guys start to understand what programming really is um, overall, why we use it, uh, you know, its importance in, in IT. Uh, and as we kind of step through this PowerPoint, you'll kind of get into the general topics. I will be kind of going through this quickly. I, I'm not going to be, uh, you know, talking five min minutes over each slide. Um, some slides I might just jump over. Um, but most of it is to just kind of get the concept to you and then uh, we'll apply that concept in working through the exercise a little bit later in this session. All right, so these are the general objectives of the chapter in the book and I, I do encourage you to take your time and read through that um, and get all the extra little pieces of information that don't happen in this PowerPoint. All right, let's talk about the, the whole thing of programming. And, and, you know, when I was first taught how to program, it was when I was, you know, firmly in a, a, four, a four year college, you know, I, I didn't have anything in high school or anything like that. Frankly, stuff wasn't around, you know, when we were uh, younger, it was kind of a special effort to go out and learn how to do computer programming. You have to like have that target and then you have to hunt down materials and tools and computers and it was kind of a thing um but ultimately uh the act of programming uh one of my old teachers told me way back when is computers are just very dumb machines they don't know what to do they just sit there um you're kind of like a car without a driver there's no point you know that doesn't go anywhere it doesn't do anything and a computer program is the set of instructions that we give to the computer in order to be able to make it do all the things that it does and on a fundamental level we, we will look at uh, operating systems because those are really uh, computer programs as well um, and then we'll look at programming really more from the high level which is where this uh, powerpoint starts and when we teach programming in a formal programming class we often start with the concept of uh, programming really being the process of solving a problem and then coming up with a set of instructions that solves that problem, or in this case, an algorithm is what that's called. So if I have a series of steps that solve a problem, that is technically an algorithm, whether it's in a computer program or not, but we most often apply that term to a computer. Um, for those of you that have taken programming classes with me on an introductory level, and you know, and Jill and Cindy Lou, I, I, I forget if you guys did or not. Um, and I'm pretty sure the rest of you here did not either. Did anybody here take maybe Intro to Python or Python with me? Dennis did. Okay. Thank you, Dennis, for reminding me. Um, and, you know, in that class, when we uh, teach, and that's, that's one that is in our data program here, um, we do start out, at least if you're taking it with me, we start out by talking about the whole process of problem solving, pseudocoding, and, and flow charting. Um, and understanding that aspect is really, to, in my mind, uh, pretty uh, critical. Now, I, I think that this is kind of interesting. They, they kind of take, you know, that, that whole thought here a little bit differently, where they throw in this, <coughs> excuse me, a term of an agent, and it says a person or a computer, right, that can follow the instructions and produce the intended result for every input every time. So what this is telling you is <coughs> no matter how you develop your algorithm, if your system and your system approach and your, you know, 
you know, the systematic approach of, uh, I'm trying to like search for the right word here, um, but the procedure that you're using to employ it should be able to work from any system to any system. So if I write a, a program um, and it runs on my computer here, I should be able to move it over to the computer next to me and it should work just as well there. And the same would be true with a set of instructions. So like if you were working off of a set of instructions that might be a recipe, and that's often, I use that in my problem solving for teaching programming often. Um, if you have a good recipe and a person follows it correctly, you know, that cake should turn out the same every time, or that finely crafted cocktail should taste just as marvelous every time. You know, that that's really the thinking here. Um, and regardless of whether it's, you know, uh, technology based or not. Um, now, they start to talk about programming in, you know, high level um, points, and they, they, they start to break it down into pieces that I think are kind of interesting here. Because when you work on a computer program, if you get the basic concepts of programming, the, the thing that's really wonderful about it is very easy um, to transfer those skills from language to language for one thing and from platform to platform. And frankly, the problem solving skills can transfer from different aspects of IT to others. So the problem solving approach that we use to write a computer program really is not much different than one I would use to maybe troubleshoot a problem on a network and a, and a physical piece of hardware. It's, it's a methodology often uh, with points where you make decisions or check for certain values and then a, adjust depending on what you're seeing. Now, when we learn how to uh, code, we can learn on various different levels. And this is what they're, they're talking about here. Um, and unfortunately, and I want you to think about this next time, maybe you're trying to move a piece of furniture with somebody or in the kitchen cooking with somebody, uh, and you're trying to make a maneuver or perform an action, and there's no communication or no clear cut um, pathway you're following, how difficult that becomes. And it's really what they're trying to point out here with the bottom bullet, you know, so even though we could use like natural languages to write instruction set, and we kind of watch our science fiction shows and we see people like on Star Trek, for example, you know, uh, you know, speak a command to the computer and the computer just knows how to do it, kind of like you're talking to Alexa or Siri. But you guys know that sometimes those things can be misinterpreted and it's difficult to really write an instruction set unless there's very clear and structured uh, syntax. And, and that's, uh, I think, what they're, they're leading to here because natural languages are typically too ambiguous. Sometimes words have multiple meanings. Um, and if you don't speak the same language, then you got a problem there too. Um, and then, you know, if you just put a husband and wife on a piece of furniture and try to move it, and you'll see what the language differences are that I'm talking about. Um, and, I, and I don't mean that as a joke uh, so much as the point that the communications and the instruction set has to be on the same page, because one person can say, turn to the left, but it's all relative to which direction you're facing, right? So if one person's facing one direction, one person's facing the other, that same instruction does not work. Right? So you have to have the same point of reference as well. Um, some of the things you will learn when you start to do programming is that we have certain basic constructs in programming languages that tend to be uh, universal across all the different languages, regardless of their syntax or their approach. And typically, you'll see all of these things be available in a language. So uh, we will be naming things. So sometimes we name positions in memory and sometimes, uh, you know, we will be working with things that have values that are constant and sometimes those values will be variable. And in order to hold values and change values, we have to address memory locations. Uh, we often have to form declarations that are statements that say, you know, this is this thing that I'm naming is really this in essence, you know, so I might say, a list of numbers and what is that well it's a list of what kind of numbers you know integers whole numbers floating numbers or you know those types of things have to be declared uh, we do work with data types in programming languages some languages like javascript and python really are kind of data type agnostic meaning they don't care how you declare a variable uh one moment you can put uh words into it the next moment you can put numbers into it next 
moment, you can put an object into it. It doesn't care. JavaScript works very much the same way. But a lot of formal languages like Java or C or C++ require that you declare your data type. So whatever you're putting into a memory location has to be a certain thing. It must be a number, not only a number, but a certain type of number, maybe an integer, maybe a floating point number, maybe a, a, a large number, maybe a very small number, maybe an exponential number, et cetera. So formal languages will declare those things. Um, additionally, we will all, in all languages, you will have capabilities where values can be assigned. So you will have what we call assignment statements. So I can not only declare a variable and name it, but then assign something to it, you know, whether it's an object, a number, or words. Um, then we form expressions, and we often check our expressions with conditionals for true, false, to make decisions within our programs to decide whether to branch one way or the other, given a certain scenario. Um, and once again, these are things that are common to all programming languages, regardless of the language. And I think it's kind of interesting because if you think about that, you know, because when you first walk into a language and you maybe you've not learned any of this, um, but then you start to learn it and you get it, that concept now transfers to every other language and you have this common component that you can move conceptually to anything new that you're learning and therefore hypothetically should be able to ramp up your skills in whatever new language comes at you pretty quickly because you get the core concepts. Um, the hardest thing of learning a new language or learning programming for the first time is learning all these concepts and then also learning the syntax of the language. Um, so kind of interesting. Now they do start to break this stuff down a little bit at a time. I'm gonna go pretty quickly through this stuff. Um, you know, looking at the number of slides we have here, I better. Um, uh, so the first thing that they talk about are, are naming things and uh, variables. And once again, variables are basically memory locations where we can store particular uh, items, numbers, words, or objects. Uh, those uh, variables typically will be named. Um, and then when we're naming things, we usually have to use certain conventions in every languages. There are some things that are, are pretty common. Um, and there's some techniques that programmers use and move from language to language on top of it all to make it, you know, a little bit more of a consistent experience. Um, so typically, in most languages, they're telling you here that when you're naming like a variable or a memory location, you cannot not use numbers, never start with numbers, and you're not allowed to use spaces. Uh, you also typically cannot use most special characters, although some are allowed. Um, and it, that's something you just have to learn language to language. But for the most part, people tend to name things either using uh, what we call camel casing, where they use like capital letters for logical separate words within a naming structure, or an underscore, that's pretty common. Another thing that's very common is uh, all uppercase for constant values. Um, but the naming is important. And, and any of you that have done programming uh, know that. Uh, most languages tend to be highly case sensitive, uh, and the point is that this declaration here is uh, not the same as this declaration here, because the capital letters are different, um, and so they they are seen as different things. And that that can be hard for people at first on any language. Uh, whenever we start to declare uh, variables, you know, we call it a declaration, and in many languages you have to formally say that you're declaring a variable. And in JavaScript, um, you know, frankly, and you should know this, in JavaScript, it's optional and also conditional upon where you're writing your variables. And, and not that we're gonna dig into this language pretty deeply, but in JavaScript, formally, you're supposed to say var, and you use that as a keyword for a variable, and then name it. In this case, you're naming multiple variables at the same time. Um, and and another thing they're pointing out here, too, is that in many languages, whatever statement you're making in the programming code often will require a terminating character or encapsulating character to terminate the code. Uh, and every language is a little bit different. The general uh, thing that you see in programming languages for at least uh, most traditional uh, high level programming languages you know, I'm thinking C, C++, C Sharp, Java, most notably those languages in that whole school. Um, 
that are kind of built from the same thread um, typically terminate all their set statements with semicolons. So whatever thing you're doing, you say, well, you know, put the oven in the cake, you know, uh, or put the cake in the oven. <laughs> it would be hard to put the oven in the cake. That would be interesting. Uh, and then the semicolon goes at the end of the statement because that's one complete statement, you know, and one complete set of instructions. Um, there are languages like Python. And so those of you that have already had your Python class uh, where you learn that that is not required in Python, whatever you put on one line is a statement. So there is no terminating character. The end of the line is the terminating character. And there are a couple languages that operate like that, but I assure you that is more an, the anomaly than the rule in most programming languages. Most of them have terminators and JavaScript is no exception. Um, yeah, it, so here it says every variable must be declared in JavaScript. The one thing I think it's kind of funny about JavaScript um, is that you don't have to put that bar keyword in front of it. You can just throw stuff out there, set, set it equal to something and it becomes a variable. Um, and that's kind of interesting. Python works very much the same way, by the way. All right, so they, they talk about uh, naming it and if there's no value in there, it's considered undefined. Um, you know, the, this concept also of, you know, you hear this word often in programming, initializing the variable it's very simply means you're putting something into the variable. So you're declaring it. And I always like to think of variables as containers. You know, it's a spot we're creating in memory, like a box. It has a name. It has a location. And in some cases, depending on the language, um, a predefined what it can hold. JavaScript and Python do not have that requirement. So all they have is the box with the name position. The moment I put something into that box or into that memory location, it is now initialized. Otherwise, if I'm pulling back information from it, who knows what will come back because it's whatever scraps were left in memory. So that's why we like to initialize variables where possible. Um, and that's what they're really showing here. You can initialize multiple variables at the same time, not that that's really important to what we're doing here today. Um, but JavaScript, the language that we're going to be using for exercise, basically deals with the data types, the things that we put into those memory locations a few different ways. So, and I want you, for those of you that have had the Python class to think about this, because this is generally how it works there as well, with one little, uh, I think, difference. And that's with the numbers. So Python does allow for Booleans, which are true false values. It also allows for strings, which are a series of characters, letters, numbers, or special characters encapsulated in quotes. Um, but then with numbers, JavaScript kind of sees numbers as one kind of thing, which is kind of strange to me. Uh, and Python sees numbers as either integers or floating point numbers. It also has some special notations for doing exponents and stuff. Um, but generally, JavaScript and Python operate pretty much the same. Uh, and any variable that you declare can dynamically change from one data type to another without doing a thing. No special formal declaration is needed to declare what goes inside a variable. You just do it. Um, yes, yeah, so they talk about writing uh, numbers in JavaScript. You know, for example, uh, if you're writing 33%, uh, you don't write it like this. That wouldn't compute. Anybody that's had programming would know that you write 0.33 because that's really the numeric representation of it. Uh, you would never include a dollar sign in front of a number. That's a formatting character. It's not part of the number. Um, and then they also have this thing. Um, what is the capability of the number system inside the programming language? And here in the, in the case of JavaScript, uh, the numbers are pretty large. So what this means is one with uh, this many zeros after it or before the uh, after the decimal point before the one going off in the decimal direction or the number of zeros after the one. So you can see that these numbers get pretty big in JavaScript and JavaScript has that capability. But in truth, it's leveraging some of the mechanics of the operating system underneath to give it that capability. Uh, you can still run out of memory if you crunch numbers that are too large. And usually if people are doing very advanced numerical calculations with programming languages, JavaScript is not gonna be the one they're gonna do it with. Python, however, is one that you would do it with uh, because it has some spe special capabilities um, 
and any of you that have been in classes with me where we've experimented with those things, um, you know that Python can do some very powerful things with numbers. It's one of the reasons why we use it for data science in the first place. Um, so in JavaScript, you know, anytime that we're writing text on the screen, we're always going to put it inside of double quotes. Um, and then we have some special characters that we call escape characters that allow us to do some special formatting, backspaces, new lines, tabs, carriage returns. Um, and then the, the conundrum of like, how do you put a double quote on the screen if it has to go inside of double quotes? Um, and or a single quote for that matter, and then you use these escape characters before them in order to put a double quote inside of double quotes. And those of you that have had programming know this, those of you that have not, this will be new material. They also show that if you're gonna mix um, quotes, you know, for example, uh, if I want this to appear with double quotes around it on the screen, um, I have to encapsulate the whole statement in single quotes and here where I want to do an apostrophe S, I have to make sure for that apostrophe to render that it's inside double quotes and not inside single quotes. Otherwise it gets misinterpreted as the end of the line is what happens. All right. All right. One thing that we, we often write is what we call strings. And when we put text directly inside quotes, we call these literal strings because they're literally the string that we're looking at. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to focus too much time on that one. Um, the other thing that was kind of interesting is once we have variables created, often we will find ourselves changing the values inside of variables. And, and typically we do that with what looks like a typical mathematical equation. But the real key here is the equal sign. So whenever in programming you see a singular equal sign, what it represents is what we call an assignment statement, meaning that the variable name listed on the left is receiving the result of the value on the right. And in this case, there's math happening on the right. There's J is might be some sort of a number divided by seven. Uh, and the result of that calculation would get stored inside of the variable weeks. If you see a double equal sign, that's not an assignment statement. That's actually a comparison. And it's really important that you understand that distinction in programming. And in Python, you will learn that because it's exactly the same in Python. In fact, exactly the same in every language I can think of. Um, and that's exactly what the person who wrote this PowerPoint is talking about here, that basically, um, yeah, the stuff on, stuff on the right gets stored in the value on the left if there's a single equal sign. That's the big takeaway. All right. So they will, we, they have some little practice things to do here, but we are going to do that later um we are oh so they actually have like a whole thing here we'll, we'll do this on our own so let's jump ahead all right so let's talk again about uh, a little bit about syntax and and i think this is kind of an interesting first bullet here and when i was reading this earlier it kind of struck me because i do get a lot of people who freak out to programming because they realize it involves math and and I don't know what's happened in, in society where everybody seems to kind of fear math now. The one thing that you should know is programming is not math, but it helps to know math to kind of program, frankly. Um, and if you do get to very high levels of study in computers fields, um, often you will take real high level math uh, because some of the things that you need to understand functionally really uh, are best expressed in, in terms of calculus unfortunately, or trigonometry or, you know, those types um, of mathematics or even set theory for that matter, uh, something you'll learn about in statistics, hopefully. Um, so ultimately, we have a bunch of expressions that we have to make and expressions uh, are usually used to do math. And we have our four mathematical operators uh, listed here. So plus, minus, multiplication, notice the asterisk for multiplication, and then the forward slash for division. Um, you know, the, the thing that kind of usually messes the people that are new to this initially is seeing this as multiplication, where normally the syntax in a math book is A, X, you know, for times uh, B. Um, so that that's probably the biggest sticking point there. All the mathematical operate operators operate under the standard order of operations for mathematics, which is what? How, do you guys know the acronym for that one? 
PEMDAS? Yes, PEMDAS. Or please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Or um, I forget, there's a couple other <laughs> different ways you can do that. Uh, but that stands for um, parentheses, uh, exponents, multiply, divide, uh, addition, and subtraction in that order. That's how the uh, expressions are made. Uh, and just like mathematics, if you want one operation to happen before another, you put parentheses around it. Um, and uh, I'm not too concerned about that. We have some special operators, though, in programming languages. JavaScript has this just like most others, which is a special type of division called modulus division, which gives us only the remainder as opposed to the result uh, in a decimal format. And this can be very useful. Uh, for doing things like making change, for example, or um, finding out what's left over. Like, you know, you know, sometimes you're interested in how many times something goes into something, but sometimes you're interested in what's left over. And that's what modulus is all about. When we start to do logic and, um, you know, branching and decision making in our programs, uh, in some cases we call it selection, uh, we often start using relational operators. So we have our traditional greater than or less than. Uh, as, as well as uh, less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, which you can easily see in the chart here. The ones that are kind of weird um, here are equal to. So remember before, the single equal sign is how we put a value in a variable. But a double equal sign is checking to see, is this thing equal to that thing? True or false is what it's looking for. And so whenever you see that double equal sign, um, that's really checking to see if whatever's on the left is equivalent to whatever's on the right. And then in some languages, JavaScript is one of them, by the way, there's also a triple equal sign where it not only has to be the same, but also has to be the same data type. So a five in double quotes on the left side is not triple equal to a five without on the other side, where in regular JavaScript it would be, by the way, kind of a bizarre anomaly. The other one that's kind of uh, bizarre is the the exclamation sign before the equal sign represents not equal to, and that's very common in a lot of languages as well. We also have some uh, logical operators that we use for you know, putting statements together, and basically the logical operators are and and or. And basically the way that an and works is that if you're, compare, you're looking at two Boolean statements of comparison, that both of them would need to be true. So you would say, like, I need to um, want to go to the movies and, and have enough money to go to the movies to go to the movies, right? In the or scenario, um, only one item needs to be true for the statement to be true. So I, I, in this case, I might have enough money. I either have to have enough money to go to the movie or I want to go to the movie. Uh, and I'll find a way to get in for free. <laughs> it would be the or, <laughs> you know, if you're trying to like do a logic, that wasn't a really good example. But in a, lo in a logical or statement, only one of the two conditions has to be true for the whole statement to be true. In programming, um, and this will vary language to language, by the way, in JavaScript, we use double ampersand for and and two pipes, which are the shift of the reverse uh, or the backslash key, usually right above your enter key on the keyboard. That's called a pipe. Um, and two of those together is a logical or. Um, we also have a, a, the not operator, which can be placed really before any operand or any item, you know, in some languages like JavaScript is one of them. So I can take something that's a true or false, put a not in front of it and negate it. Uh, kind of interesting. Um, we talk about operator overload, not really too uh, use are too concerned about that um you know the one thing that you have to remember with uh the operator overload and what they're trying to get to here um is we can use it for math yes but we also use it to do what what else can you use a plus sign for in most languages concatenate there you go and that is to join strings together which really isn't math but it is the most common concatenation symbol in just about every language. Once again, a couple of anomalies. Some languages don't use the plus sign to do concatenation. Um, all right. And I'm kind of moving down here. One of the things that we are going to play with a little bit in our exercise today 
uh, are if statements. And uh, the one thing I'll talk about too, which I think is pretty important, is we usually solve programming problems using um, three approaches. And, and anybody that's had me in a class, a programming class, should know this, right? And, and try to memorize it if you can. But usually you solve problems either through a step-by-step -step method, which is called sequence, um, uh, by getting to like maybe a fork in the road where you need to make a decision, and that's called selection. And that's what this slide is about, by the way, um, where you look at a condition, and if the condition is true, you go one way. If it's false, you go the other way. And then we also have repetition, which is the ability to repeat code under certain circumstances, because often, you know, uh, to solve a problem, you might get to the point where it's like, uh, well, I just have to repeat this step 20 times until all of it's done, and then I move on to the next thing. And it's silly to write the instruction 20 times as opposed to just say repeat 20 times and just do it. Um, and so sequence, selection, and repetition are the three techniques we use for solving logical problems. Here, where we do the selection or the decision statements, conditional statements, uh, one of the more common approaches in programming is using what we call an if statement. So we'll say if, and we phrase a conditional statement to check for true or false. And if true, we perform the statement. If not, we move on and we do something else. Uh, but the statement that we put inside here does have to evaluate to true or false. And so here's a spot where you often use those uh, double equal sign or greater than or less than or ands and ors and stuff go usually in those positions. Um, and then remember, if true, then you execute a statement and then sometimes you have an else to that statement and sometimes you don't. Um, you know, the, the, the general thing though, and, and this is actually a, a pretty good little example. It says here, if, so we have a variable that, variable that might hold the water temperature uh, is if that water temperature is less than 32, well, the state of the water is frozen. You know, so logically, you can kind of see where that goes. Um, they kind of like go through this whole process here of uh, indicating this, uh, talk about indenting and, and whatever. In some cases, we write some of these statements and they become compound statements, uh, meaning that we have a whole bunch of things that follow the if. And, and when that happens, we usually have to encapsulate that code. In Python, we indent. In all other languages, we put curly brackets around it if it's more than one statement. Uh, the general rule of thumb, I always recommend put curly brackets around it, even if it's one statement. That way, if you add one, you don't have to go back and add it. Another statement, you don't have to add the curly brackets later. Um, the other uh, conditional extension is the if else um, thing. So, you know, if, you know, it's less than 32 degrees, water's frozen else you know water is not frozen right i mean that that's the logical result there but that's an example uh you can also take that logic and put if statements inside of if statements and, and anybody that's in the programming classes totally knows what i'm talking about uh and then they go through here and um they talk about the espresso program and this is the thing that we are going to go ahead and and build here in class folks and this is basically the exercise um so what I'd like to do now, if you guys don't mind, it is a quarter after six. I'd like to do about uh, a slightly longer break than normal. So let's let's do about a, a seven or eight minute break. It's six fourteen. Let's come back at six twenty three. So almost ten minutes. Yeah, it's a pretty long break. Uh, it's a combination of things. I'm I'm going to get set up for the exercise here, and then I'm also putting finishing touches on uh, unit fourteen for you guys. All right, and uh, we'll see you at that time. All right, we are going to continue our uh, work here, and uh, you see I have the PowerPoint kind of pushed off to the side here a little bit, but I wanted to talk about what we're about to do, which is to build basically the exercise for this chapter, which does come from this PowerPoint, so it does come from our chapter example. Um, but before you can start to code, you need to have at least a, a basic text editor. Now, every operating system, by the way, does come with one because um, it is considered a fundamental tool for any operating system if you need to make any repairs or edits to any of the configuration files um, or to alter code. Um, you know, it's a text editor that does the work. Now, in Windows, we have a built-in text editor called Notepad. And you can see 
on my screen, it does not come up as default anymore. Um, but that's the tool. And yes, you could write the code we're about to write using that tool. You don't really need to download uh, anything. Um, however, it is better to use a higher level tool. And when you get into programming, you'll probably very be very quickly be told by whoever's teaching it to you which tool they recommend that you use. And for some languages, you do get in the situation where there's really not a lot of choices for tools. And but most languages these days, you have a, a bunch of different tools you can use um, and get your work done. Because JavaScript really does not require that much, we can do a lot of this in the primitive text editor, but this is also a really good opportunity to get and download what I consider to kind of be the kind of like the, the Swiss army knife of text editors in many ways. And this is a tool called Notepad++. So if you look inside the course shell here, you're going to notice I have a little bit of an entry uh, about Notepad++, including a link on where to go to download uh, the latest version. So if you can uh, if you're interested in downloading the product, if you can follow this link and go to the Notepad++ uh, website, and I want you to be a little bit cautious here because some of this stuff is ads, like these big green buttons here are not the download button, so don't click on those. Uh, but if you're looking to download the installer for this, there's a 32-bit version and a 64-bit version. And in almost every circumstance, folks, I always recommend going with the 64-bit version of the software because it will work more efficiently on your system than the 32-bit. Um, and if you're a Windows user in this situation, you would download this installer right here that will go through the process of installing it like any other normal piece of software on your system. Another option, um, if you would prefer not to have an installed program is to do a portable version. So you download a zip file, unzip it, everything ends up in a folder. You just go into that folder and run the executable. And some people like that. Um, and so if you prefer that, feel free uh, to do that. Um, but this tool, and I'll launch it here on my screen right now, and get off that tab that I have open. But it's not a very special looking tool when you open it up. It's a, it's a very primitive uh, text editor in, in appearance. However, it does have the ability to work with just about every major known programming language and its syntax so it has color coding and syntax highlighting for just about any language that you can even fathom in fact they have so many available that they have them broken down into alphabetical sub menus and I'm just kind of hovering over them and showing you how many there are and you can see like the one thing that we will find in here is uh, javascript and so it naturally does encode for javascript uh, code now we are going to use this tool, or at least I am. If you prefer to use regular notepad, that will work just fine too. Um, but we need some sort of basic text editor. If there's anybody here that happens to be either on a Linux platform or uh, a Mac uh, platform, the Linux distribution that you have will have a built-in editor. You'll have to discover which one that is for your, whatever GUI you're using. On the Mac OS, we have a tool called text edit. But you have to be careful when you're using that tool to make sure that you save as a plain text file. Because uh, otherwise it will default to rich text file, which is not something uh, web browsers can read and execute code from. All right, let's uh, jump back over now uh, that we have, you know, one of those tools in place and anybody that, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that most of you that are in this session already have these tools or know about them. Or just going to do the work inside of notepad but if you need help doing the install just let me know and i'd be happy to to guide you but let's take a, a real quick look at the program that we're gonna uh build here uh for our exercise and it's a program known as the espresso program and its purpose is this the the program computes the price of four different kinds of espresso espresso drinks based on what drink it is the size of it the number of extra shots that go into it and the sales tax. And we are gonna write the code to process all of this. And they're gonna begin by basically giving us all of the code. And we're gonna take this code and type it in uh, incrementally. In fact, I'm gonna do that little by little, but without getting into the details here, this is the overview of the whole thing. 
let's talk about the the bits and pieces that are going to go into it so as with most programs there's usually some sort of input that we give the program whether it's interfacing with the user or it's hard coded into the code um, but the inputs that we're looking for here are going to be what type of drink it's going to be is it an espresso a latte a cappuccino americano or whatever uh, how many ounces is it eight 12 or 16 and how many shots are in the drink one two three or four shots of espresso and then whatever the sales tax rate so all of those items become inputs to the program and we will go in to the program and manually adjust some of these things not all of them but some of these things uh, and change the inputs to see the results the output that we're going to see is going to be basically text back on the screen and what we're going to see as a result is the final cost of whatever whatever it is that we're purchasing um, in terms of the variables that we're going to build into the program we are going to have variables that will hold the type of drink how many ounces that drink is and how many shots and then uh, a variable that ultimately will hold the price which will be for output and notice how it's different on the right margin there and then a tax rate which of course we're not going to be changing every time but looks to be at 8.8% uh, tax rate. Uh, finally, there's a section of the program here where we run a series of if statements or conditional statements to make selections relative to the inputs that we gave. So for example, if the drink ends up being an espresso, which is one little singular shot of coffee, I'm assuming, um, the price is just 140. That's the only option for it. And the espresso is just those little cups. If the drink happens to be a latte, and then this terminology here is or, by the way, or the drink is a cappuccino, then we go to see it's at 8, 12, or 16 ounce. And depending on which one of those conditions hits as true, then the price will be set accordingly because there's a different price for each size. Right. And these are considered what we call nested if statements or logic statements because they are inside the code for the outer one of whether it's a latte or a cappuccino. So either it's a latte or a cappuccino uh, before it gets into here and checks to see the size. If we happen to have an Americano, then that has its own separate uh, price. So none of the conditions above caught. And then this one will catch. And then there's a price. A uh, dollar twenty plus thirty cents uh, times an ounce, and I'm not really sure what the ounce is. Oh, how many? Oh, okay, whatever the size of your coffee is is what that one is. And then we put together the price, which is a combination of uh, whatever price we've calculated above for whatever drink or size, um, plus the cost of any extra shots of espresso if there are any, and then we add in the tax rate, and then that will end up on the screen. So we'll go through that that whole um process of that and as they indicate here um you know try to like change the inputs is really what they're getting to and see what kind of different results are you getting and more importantly is it working correctly that's really what it comes down to so what i'm going to do uh for starters here is i'm going to move this powerpoint off the screen and then i'm going to uh begin by just having my text editor ready here and I'm going to start copying in uh, some of this code. Now, if you notice that on the assignment listing itself, we have you know a screenshot of the code right here. And what I'm going to do is I'll move my text editor over to the right here and basically copy this in is what I'm going to do. Um, but all the while kind of explaining the, the process and the procedure of it uh, and then seeing if we can get it to work. We'll make sure everybody works and then we'll call it a night. All right, so here... Um, comes my text editor and if I'm actually clever about this I can probably collapse this down again even a little bit more screen real estate I think that's pretty good and we're, we're going to begin now by creating this code as it, as it is written right here on the screen now I want you to notice there's a couple areas of the code which indicates um, basically an instruction so you see that these two special symbols right here are what we call comment marks so everything in between 
the slash and the star and the star and the slash are comments are not really part of the code. They're information for us as the programmers. We do not have to replicate that part of it. But we do have to replicate everything that starts on line 10. So I'm just going to start, I'm not going to start right at the top. I'm just going to move down a line or two uh, and start typing in this code. And, and the first three things that they're having us put in, as was in the slideshow, was a variable declaration and then the name of the drink to start with. And we're hard coding this in, by the way. So we're kind of presetting the input is really what we're doing. So the first drink we're going to try is a latte. Then we'll add another variable for the ounces of the drink or the size of the drink. And um, in this case, we're going to make it a 12 ounce drink. The one thing that I forgot to do on the first line, so I've been writing too much Python lately, is put in my terminating character, which is a semicolon at the end of each one of those lines. And if you don't do that, you will trigger errors uh, on the code. Next, we will type in a variable declaration for shots, and that's for the shots of espresso. And this one will have two shots, and I assume this is the extra shots that we want. Um, we are also going to set up a variable that will generically hold the price that we're calculating. And I want you to notice that we're not putting anything in there uh, to start with. So that one would be uninitialized where these are initialized, the ones up above, because they have values. This one is being created, but not having anything stored inside of it. Uh, finally, we'll add the next variable, which is going to be the tax rate that we use to calculate sales tax correctly. And the number we're going to use here is uh, 0 0.088 for the tax rate. All right. So now that we have that piece in place, um, let's move on. Let's create a, a couple of blank lines here. And now let's go through the process of creating the if statements that we see listed. Uh, and go back to the web page here. I'm gonna just give it a click or two of zoom. It'll help us to see it a little bit better. And I'm basically gonna be copying in the code that we see on the screen here. And so I'll begin with the first statement uh, for espresso. So we're gonna type if, and then inside of parentheses, if the drink is equivalent to equal signs, notice, to espresso. Close the double quotes, close the parentheses. Then we move down to the next line and we indent. I mean, you don't have to indent, but that's typically the pattern most programmers do. A couple, two, three, four spaces. Uh, some people will use uh, tab stops instead. It, it really doesn't matter. Um, and if it's an espresso, ultimately the price will be $1.40. And that with a semicolon. Now, this is interesting because an if statement like this will operate just like it does in Python. So in other words, if we have just one statement that follows the if, we don't need any curly brackets around the results of it. But I'm going to caution you on that because what happens is you start to add statements to what you think is an if statement and they, they end up sometimes being somewhere else and it ends up confusing you, uh, especially if you start to build out a program. So I always recommend to people, you should put the curly brackets in anyhow. Uh, I think it's a better practice uh, and it puts you in a position where you're ready to add more code uh, if you wish. All right, now uh, that if statement is complete and we will move on to the next one. Uh, the next one checks to see if the drink is equal or equivalent to a latte, then the pipe symbol, or is the drink equivalent to a cappuccino? And you close our parentheses. So if either condition is true, either it's a latte or it's a cappuccino, then we go inside the if statement and run the other if statement. So here we do need the opening curly bracket, and I'm seeing that we need probably about five or six lines in there. I probably shouldn't make too many, but I should close that curly bracket somewhere down here so I know when it ends. Now I'm going to come inside here between those curly brackets, and I'm going to add a, 
uh, some statements, but I am going to come away from the margin, and I'm using my tab key to, to jump inwards, by the way. And now I'm going to write the series of if statements that we see here, uh, one at a time. So if the drink, if the ounces, uh, you know, if ounce equals eight, so it's an eight ounce drink, be careful here, double equal sign, then and watch, I'm putting in curly brackets and notice the sample code does not have them. You guys catching this? Um, but that's my habit. I consider it a, a safer, better habit than forgetting them. So the price is 195. And then since we're basically following this formatting here, folks, the next one's gonna be basically the same. And then we're going to do that again. So I'm just pasting it in twice, and then I'm just going to tweak the numbers. So this one's going to be 12 ounces and 235. This one's going to be 16 ounces and 275. And then so I don't confuse all the curly brackets, I'm going to backspace this one to the margin. Seems to be you know, easier uh, to see it that way. I'll do the same with this one. And do you notice kind of an interesting little effect here of Notepad++? When I click, when, when I'm right next to one of these um, curly brackets, it shows me it's matching pair, right? Or it's, or it's the one that it, that it works with. So if you happen to like forget one and you click here, where's its match? Well, it thinks this one is, even though that's not correct, but it does help you track things down so be careful whenever you open one you got to close one and you know kind of like parentheses all right so now we have the middle statements complete now we'll move on to the last if statement so we'll come back down here and this time we'll do the americano so we'll say if the drink is equivalent to um americano and i'm not sure why that one's capitalized there but i'm going to i'm going to stick with lowercase so i I remember um, then the price will be a dollar twenty plus the thirty cents times each additional ounce divided by eight. So we're just following the formula they have here. I forget what the rationale is, but we go with the formula assuming it's correct. All right. And then we're gonna close this curly bracket here. Now we're going to come down here and finish off the program. And in this case, we're just going to do the calculations um, that we need. So we're going to take that price variable we set up and the price will be the price of the, the key price that we figured out. So we're depending on the drink. And then we're going to see if there's any extra shots in the mix here. And I'm not really sure why they're doing the minus one, but I'm taking it on faith that it's correct because they're probably accommodating for the shot already in the drink or something, I'm not really sure. And then they're multiplying by 50 cents. And then finally, um, we're doing the final calculation with the tax, so the price will then also incorporate the price plus uh, the tax, which is price times uh, tax rate. And the uh, don't forget to put your semicolon at the end there and some people might be tempted to put parentheses around here worrying that the order of operations might not work correctly you don't really need them but you might think of it that way a little more efficiently all right so that's all the javascript code that we have and now interestingly what i'm going to do here is uh, kind of a little bit weird because our next step is we have to take this JavaScript code and then insert it into an HTML uh, document uh, to make it work. And we're going to kind of bo borrow from this approach a little bit. So what they're not giving you here is this piece. You kind of have to work through this piece on your own. But remember, we had a little bit of experience with HTML in this course, so we're going to leverage that. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to save the file that I'm working on right now, um, and I'm going to save it as a JavaScript file uh, initially. So let's do uh, a save as, 
and then I want you to find a file location where you keep the homework for this class and put it into that folder structure. So for me, I'm going to be going to my uh, fundamentals of IT folder, and uh, I guess this is the unit 13 uh, exercise, so I'm just going to call it that, and it's going to go inside there. And then I'm going to save this file, and I'm just going to type script script dot js and we're not going to really be calling this in externally but we'll talk about that uh, but we will just very simply save the file and save it in the right format for a couple of reasons and the one reason is probably something you just noticed is as soon as i saved it as a javascript file the color coding for javascript kicked in and what's kind of nice about that is if you start to forget to do something let's say I forget to like close a statement or I forget a semicolon you know so what you're going to start to see is sometimes things start to break now in these situations they're not breaking because there's other mechanisms that are kind of helping support it but in other circumstances you might be writing a statement and I'm trying to like trigger it to color code bad but I'm not doing a very good job of it here but one tip for how you're while well, you're writing a program is the color coding inside of your editor uh, higher end, uh, what we call integrated development environments and I, or IDEs, the higher end coding tools, which some of you are already using, will also do syntax highlighting and underlining, indicating where problems in your code exist. Unfortunately, Notepad++ does not do that. It just goes as far as color coding the code, uh, which for most circumstances for simple stuff like this is just fine. All right. Now that we've done that, we also need to now create an HTML file in order to run this code and then see it on the screen. And so let's begin uh, by going up to the file menu and creating a new file, and then right away doing a save as on it, putting it into that same folder. So I am in the same folder, and this time I'm going to name that file index html exactly that you might get your file system squawking at you are you sure you want to change the file extension of course you are so change it and then we'll take our time here to basically build up the simple html document which will then be used to present our page but i got to give you a care careful caution here if you do this if you write this piece here and turn this in thinking that's going to work that's not going to work. What you really have to do is you have to take all of this JavaScript code that we've created, and that gets inserted inside the script tag here. And then we will output it here. And even this is actually incorrect because we won't output total. We will output price and whatever message we want to give. All right, so we're going to do this one piece at a time. Um, and so let's just start with the very first declaration. Let's start with the doc type. And now I get this question a lot. Do it, does it have to be all uppercase? No, it doesn't. You can do it all lowercase. It doesn't really care. I, my preference is actually all lowercase. I think it's easier to type. So doc type HTML exclamation at the beginning. It's required at the beginning of all HTML documents. Then we'll create our opening and closing HTML tags. So there's the opening. And then I'm closing it right away, making a little space in between. And then I'm going to come back up here towards the top. I'm going to come in one indent, and I'm going to paste in or type in the head section of the document. And the head section is going to be doing most of our work here. So I'm going to create a lot of space in there today and close that right away. Come back up to the top one more time. I'm going to indent in one level and create the title. Uh, and I guess we can call this uh, coffee page or whatever. All right. Next, we're in the head section still, we are gonna create opening and closing script uh, tags. And we are gonna place all of our JavaScript inside of that area. And then I will also demonstrate how you can link to the file externally if you wish. 
Now we'll come down below the head section and we will create the body section of the document. So let's go ahead and create the opening and closing of the body. I'm going to put the closing of the body near the bottom here. And then inside the body, let's put some stuff on the screen. So if we copy exactly what's on, on the thing here, we can say, welcome to my page. I'm not really so worried about that. Um, what we could say, um, maybe it doesn't have to be an H1, but you know, okay, let's, in fact, let's do an H1. Um, coffee page, you know, that might work okay. And then let's put in another uh, thing, and this can just be, uh, frankly, a, a paragraph. And in the paragraph, we can say um, the cost of your coffee, and I see they're kind of doing that uh, below. And then I'm going to close my paragraph and I'm going to kind of alter a little bit from what they're doing as an example here. And if you notice, um, we are going to be doing basically an output right into the HTML code. And this is a very typical uh, thing that we do is we put in script tags in line with the HTML just to output to the browser, whatever the price is going to be. So we're going to sort of copy this. Um, but kind of with our own little twist on it. All right, so I'm going to create another paragraph here, and I'm going to say price, colon, space, and a dollar sign. And then after that, I'm going to insert my script tag, just like they do in the example, and I'm going to issue the document.write command which will write to the screen, by the way, right in this position. And then we're gonna insert here the price from the JavaScript code that we wrote. And then we're gonna close the script tag right there. Uh, and then also close the paragraph. All right. So now let's go ahead and save this document. So do Control S to save if you haven't done that already. And what we're gonna do next is grab all the JavaScript code from our other program. So I'm going to grab all of this code here, and I'm going to kind of be a little, you know, preemptive a little bit here. So here's kind of my thing: is once I, I paste it in here, I'm going to want to in, indent it a little bit. So I'm kind of planning for that in advance. So I'm going to highlight all of this and copy. I'm going to bring it back over to my HTML file. I'm going to paste it right where the cursor is. Yes, it's in the margin, but I'm going to highlight all of that. And then I'm going to hit my use my tab key to indent it so it all sits neatly inside the script tags. And I'm going to zoom out ever so slightly on, on my code here so you guys can see it a little better. But here's the entirety of all of it. So all that JavaScript here got dropped in. Right. And you're allowed to do this in HTML. In other words, create a web page document that has a script section. And then once you're inside those script tags, you can execute JavaScript code. Where is the code actually executed? It's executed by your web browser. That's kind of an interesting thing about JavaScript, which is why it's so popular on the internet, is it can be transmitted like any web page but it's your local machine that does the work on the program, which is kind of interesting. So now that we have this all saved, um, we're going to run this. We're going to go to the folder where the index file is stored. So you're going to have to go to your file system here, folks, and navigate your way to that folder. So I'm going to my G drive. I'm going to find my fundamentals of IT folder my unit 13 exercise folder, and there's my index.html page. For some of you, remember, we did this whole thing with the HTML pages. Sometimes those file extensions are hidden. Um, and so if you double click this and it does not open in a browser, we'll have to fix that. But for right now, I'm going to go ahead and double click this and run it. And you will see very quickly that it's generating the page that we're talking about. And it's also giving me uh, the price. 
Now, this is based, once again, upon the fact that the input is, or the inputs are the inputs I have on the screen here. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to play with these inputs a little bit, and then you will see the result. So in this case, we have latte, but what if my drink is an espresso? Okay. And how many, how many ounces? Well, it doesn't really matter how many ounces an espresso is, does it? Um, and I think I'm going to be okay here. I think I can just go ahead and run it. So I'm going to save my file, Control S. I'm going to come back to the browser because this is now saved. And I'm going to refresh, and you should see a different cost. And is that correct? Well, in that case, we'd have to go through here and do some you know, figuring. And what you would do is you would walk through the program, and we know that it triggered espresso because that's what I typed. And so we have a base price of 140 We know none of this will kick in because it doesn't apply. And then we come down here, and we put the price of 140 and then the shots minus one, so two minus one is one times 50 cents. So we add 50 cents to the drink, which would make it 190. And then we multiply in the tax rate. And so I can do this in my calculator. So if, if it's 190 times the uh, tax rate, 206.72 is about right. Okay, so $2.07 is what it would work out to be. Now, if you wanted to make this a little bit more useful program, and, and you know, if we were in a programming class, I would totally make you do this. You can also not only output the price, right? You could also output what the person ordered. So, for example, I could even put that, um, you know, so maybe this would actually say something like receipt or whatever. Um, so we're kind of building a kind of like a primitive receipt if you want to um, think of it that way. And then here where we might have price, we might also do something like um, this. maybe another paragraph um, that lists what you ordered. And so in this case, we could copy this approach here with the script. And then instead of outputting just the price, we can output what you ordered. So you could output um, the drink name, right? Um, we could also, and I'm missing my closing bracket there. Um, maybe put in a, a comma and a space, and then maybe paste in the script again and output the size. And what would we put there? Ounce followed by ounce comma, and then maybe say number of shots and then paste in the script again and here put shots and, and the point being is really what you're doing is you're generating all the all the things that are we are considering inputs we're just putting them back on the screen so that people can see them and so let me just go ahead and save this. I'm doing Control S to save. I'm coming back to the browser and running it. And you know, I should change the drink. Um, let's try cappuccino. All right. And let's make it a, what are our eight, 12 and 16 were our choices? Let's make it a 16 ounce. And I'm really sleepy. So let's make it uh, three shots. And let's save that once again, and now we'll run it. And now you should see here, you know, we changed everything. So transaction receipt, cappuccino, 16 ounce, number of shots, three, price $4.08. Now, whether that's correct or not, 
we would have to go through and calculate. And so um, what I would recommend that you do just to make sure that you're okay is bring up your calculator and just do the calculations uh, just to verify. Um, and so a cappuccino is a 16 ounces, 275. And then, um, so once we have 275, we subtract one from the shot. So one comes with the coffee. So two extra shots of 50 cents adds a dollar, right? Um, and then we multiply that times 1.088, which gives us 408, spot on. So it's working just fine. Now, with some of them, we had like fractional values and yes there's ways where you can format the numeric output so it's always dollars and cents but that's not my big concern here the big concern really is to get you guys to get the core of this working and um what i'll do is i'll just kind of leave this up on screen here in a way where you can see all the code at once and let you guys copy i'm going to pause the recording and see if there's any questions or anybody's having any problems all right, so that that is the demonstration and completion of the exercise. Um, you know, so the biggest extrapolation of it is, you know, coming up with the output part of it. And, you know, they're kind of assuming that you'd figure out to put price here, you know, ultimately. But I think that the example that I put together here is a little bit better and, and, and gives you a little bit more meaningful output. Uh, all right, folks, that ends this recording and uh, we are moving on from here.